In this video, we consider efficient GMM estimation. So far, we have introduced the GMM estimator and we have discussed some high level conditions in order to ensure that the GMM estimator is consistent and asymptotically normally distributed. We recall here that if the model parameters are identified, that if a law of large numbers applies to the data and that a central limit theorem applies to the data, then the GMM estimator is asymptotically normally distributed with some covariance matrix V. Here we note that the asymptotic covariance matrix V depends on the first derivative of the function f, which is related to the moment conditions. It depends on the asymptotic covariance of the moments, and it depends on the choice of weight matrix W. Here the matrix D is the expectation of the first derivative of the function f. We may think of the matrix W as the limit of the weight matrix Wt. Lastly, S is the asymptotic covariance matrix of the function f. So at this stage, an interesting question to ask is, what is actually the, the smallest possible variance that the GMM estimator can take? And can we select a weight matrix such that we know that the GMM estimator attains this smallest possible variance? It can be shown that if we choose the weight matrix W to be the inverse of the S matrix, then we have the smallest possible value of V and hence the smallest possible variance of the GMM estimator. And we say that the GMM estimator is sufficient. Hence, our aim here should be to choose a weight matrix WT that has limit given by the inverse of S in order to obtain the optimal weight matrix. And it follows that we essentially just need a consistent estimator for S in order to get an optimal weight matrix. Recall that S is the asymptotic covariance matrix of the sample moments. So we may write S as 1 over T times the variance of the sum of the functions as F. And we may really we may really want to think about this quantity in the sense that we should let t tend to infinity. We may observe here that s will in general depend on the properties of f, in particular whether f is correlated or not over time, and we will look into different situations. In the following, we will use some shorthand notation where ft of theta simply refers to the function f. We will start out by a simple case where we have that the function f is not correlated over time, which gives a fairly nice structure of the matrix S, meaning that we can come up with some fairly nice estimator for S. We recall here that S was simply 1 over T times the variance of the sum of the FTs. Note that since FT is uncorrelated over time, we have that the variance of the sum of the FTs is the same as the sum of the variances of the FTs. 
and then using the fact that ft has mean zero because this just corresponds to the moment condition we simply end up with the average of the expectation of ft squared so in order to estimate s consistently we may simply just compute the average of ft ft prime and we refer to this as the heteroscedasticity consistent estimator for the covariance matrix the reason why this estimator is hysteroscedasticity consistent is that ft may actually not have the same variance for all t's meaning that we may in general allow for heteroscedasticity here note that in practice we do not know theta zero so in practice we will replace theta zero with a consistent estimator which could be based on a first step gmm estimator here the first step gmm estimator refers to the case where we may just have selected some arbitrary weight matrix wt it could be the identity matrix and recall that given that we have identification and the law of large numbers the gmm estimator based on this arbitrary weight matrix should actually be consistent it is not in general efficient but it's a consistent estimator and we can use that in order to to obtain an, an estimator for st the second case we will consider is the case where ft is actually correlated over time and that yields a more complex structure of the covariance matrix s again we start out by stating s which is simply one over t times the variance of the sum of the fts now in the case where the fts are correlated over time we get all the covariances uh, entering in, in the expression for the covariance matrix s so in general we will have one over t then sum from t equal to one to capital t and the sum from s equal one to capital t of the expectation of ft times fs prime we know here that we have just as many covariances as we have observations and the number of covariances will increase by the number of observations this means that in practice it will be infeasible to estimate the variance s just based on sample covariance matrices now the solution is to use a so-called kernel estimator the kernel estimator is stated in terms of the sample covariances of ft So here we introduce gamma t of j, which is a matrix that is simply the average of ft and ft minus j. Now, as mentioned, we have just as many covariances as we have observations which means that it will be impossible to estimate all covariances consistently as the number of observations tends to infinity. So instead, what we will do is that we will base our estimator on this gamma t j and then assume that for j sufficiently large, meaning that when the distance between ft and ft minus j is quite large in terms of time, then we can simply ignore the covariances meaning that we should in general only put some weight on, on our observations that are close to each other. So the estimator that we propose is, is st, that is gamma t of zero, which corresponds to this, the sample uh, variance of ft, and then plus the sum from j equal one to t minus one of omega j times gamma t of j plus gamma t of j prime. Here, omega j is some weight function. Omega j will typically put some positive weight on 
covariances that have a low order, say for, for small j's, and then put very little or perhaps zero weight to autocovariances of higher order. Thank you for watching.